Creme 2 News begins now. Thank you for joining us on Creme 2 Plus. I'm Tim Pham. This is your Creme 2 News Week in Review. Join us as we take a closer look at some of the biggest stories in the Inland Northwest this past week. Well, the details of this case are disturbing. This woman's body was found in different parts of the city more than a decade apart. DNA technology is once again providing a major break in yet another cold case. It was a gruesome discovery. In June 1984, fishermen on the Spokane River found a woman's nude body. It was missing hands, feet, and a head. The Spokane Police Department says no women matching the medical examiner's description were reported missing at the time. The body couldn't be identified. Then nearly 14 years later, a woman walking her dog near 7th and Sherman found a human skull. It belonged to the body found more than a decade earlier, but DNA could not be matched to any offenders, crime scenes, or missing persons in the combined DNA index system known as CODIS. Even with forensic drawings and a facial reconstruction of the skull, the victim's identity remained unknown until this year. Spokane detectives sent DNA samples to Othram, a company that specializes in working with degraded samples. It's the same company that helped crack the 1959 Candy Rogers murder case last year. Using genetic genealogy, Othram provided SPD with a list of potential family members, one of them still living in Spokane. This February, 38 years later, the woman was finally identified as Ruth Bell Waymeyer. Born in 1960, Ruth attended Rogers High School, this photo from her sophomore year. Police learned that Ruth moved to Spokane with her mom and sister after her parents divorced. Shortly after, her mom died, her sister moved away, the two didn't stay in touch. Ruth was married twice but never reported missing and authorities still don't know who killed her. Police say her second husband, Trampus Vaughn, served time in prison before coming to the Pacific Northwest and marrying Ruth in Wenatchee. He died in California six years ago. Police have not ruled him out as a suspect, and no other suspects have been identified, including Ruth's first husband, who lives in Spokane and is cooperating with the investigation. Ruth was just 24 at the time of her death. An autopsy revealed she likely gave birth a year or two before her murder. SPD and investigators with the medical examiner's office are hoping someone who knew Ruth, her husband's, or perhaps her child will contact police through crime checks so there can be justice. Ruth would have turned 63 next month. With Ruth identified, detectives now hope they can paint a better picture of what happened to her and who could be responsible for her death. For 40 years, Spokane police knew the dismembered body found in the Spokane River June of 1984 as Millie. Her real name is Ruth. Bell Waymeyer. Detective Sergeant Zach Stormont says identifying Millie as Ruth wasn't easy. Our lab in Cheney, the Washington State Patrol crime lab, uh, it was difficult for them to actually get a sample. But Othram Labs was able to create a DNA profile through the degraded DNA. Then through genetic genealogy, the lab provided SPD with a list of potential family members. Stormont says the Eureka moment came when cross-referencing that list with a divorce certificate signed with Millie's real name. It listed her and her sister on that form. Storman says he's been in contact with Ruth's younger sister and explained how Ruth was a Spokane mystery for the last 40 years. She's going all th through all those stages of grief with it right now. Storman says the sisters went their separate ways at a young age. He says the only family member who could have potentially reported Ruth as missing was her mother, who died two years before Ruth was found dead. SPD also identified two of Ruth's husbands, SPD says the first is still alive and cooperating in the investigation. Ruth was married to the second at the time of her death, Trampus Vaughn. He's a, a mystery. He used different names at times in some records, in marriage records and driver's license and things like that that I'm in interested in. Um, so I'm hoping some people can shed light on him. He died six years ago, but has not been ruled out as a suspect. Stormont says the forensic portion of the case is complete, but there's still work to do. So I hope people out there that do know something or knew her in high school, Rogers High School, classes 76 through about 1980, might know her or her sister. I'd love to hear from those people and uh, see if we can put it all together and close it properly. At the time of her death, Ruth was 24. No suspects have been identified in the investigation. 
An autopsy revealed Ruth may have also had a child one to two years before she died. Spokane police are urging people who may know something about Ruth or her potential child or children to come forward. Ruth would have been 63 next month. In the studio, Janelle Finch, Crime 2 News. New filings in the Moscow murder case show prosecutors have found and are now sharing with the defense possible Brady Giglio material. Now, while much of the information is sealed, we do know it has something to do with a, quote, confidential internal affairs investigation of one of the officers in the case. And it could be huge for the defense or it could be totally meaningless. So since we don't know what it is. Defense attorney John Henry Brown says Brady Giglio means law enforcement and prosecutors have to turn over any evidence or information that may help the defense. Actually, under Giglio and Brady, uh, prosecutors have an obligation to look for such evidence. Sometimes that's evidence which exonerates the accused. But with mention of an internal affairs investigation, it sounds like this case is about a potential challenge to the credibility of a police officer. Most police departments have created what's called the Brady List. And on the Brady List are uh, officers, detectives, internal personnel who have um, committed some sort of an error in the past. Uh, and that the defense should be told about it. Brown cautions Brady Giglio disclosures like this are pretty common because not handing over the information can get cases overturned. And the Brady Giglio material referenced here may have nothing to do with the Moscow murder case itself. It could be something as small as the DUI 25 years ago. Um, or it could be something more serious. Obviously, the most serious thing for the prosecution, the state would be if the officer, detective, or whatever, has some history of not telling the truth. Creme 2 News reached out to law enforcement in Idaho, Washington, and also in Pennsylvania, where the suspect was arrested, to try to find out which agency is involved. We've also submitted public records requests for more information. Shannon Mowdy, Creme 2 News. On March 20th, representatives from the Spokane Community Against Racism, or SCAR, released a scathing letter signed by 21 community organizations, condemning police chief Craig Meidel and asking for his resignation. Our chief of police is using city resources to advance the agenda of a narrow group of powerful business owners, lending them more power than the average Spokaneite. The call for his removal comes after the city's police ombudsman released the findings of an internal investigation that showed hundreds of emails were exchanged between Chief Meidel and members of the Spokane Business and Commercial Property Owners Council. Jack Archer with SCAR has read through the report and has several concerns. We've seen, according to these emails, that the Spokane Police Department has been actively deprioritizing calls in certain parts of the city and to certain spaces while providing a higher and better level of service to people that the chief is politically aligned with. But Chief Meidel disagrees. So we had businesses that were closing shop, they were leaving downtown. Uh, we were being told, uh, if not daily, at least weekly, their, their employees are afraid to come to work. We also received a lot of complaints from visitors downtown that they were constantly having to step over people that were um, shooting up or smoking fentanyl on foil. And this group from the Spokane Property Owners and Business Association, which I'm told was about 400 strong, wanted to, wanted to try to work with the police department to create a safer downtown. And so their, their request of us was, what can we do? So working with them and explaining to them, here's what the hurdles are for us. And that's really what this boils down to, is, is providing them information from our perspective of tools and things that we need to create that safer downtown. It's important to, for me to point out that we have done this for many organizations. The investigation shows Chief Meidel released numerous reports to members of that group, including data on the shoplifting increase around the city, transient crime map, and on the city council's response to defunding police. There is nothing released that would, that would violate any kind of um, privacy laws, no names, dates of birth, phone numbers. All public servants have relationships with their constituents. That is natural and absolutely necessary to do their job. 
What is unnatural, what is unfair, is the fact that we know for, from these emails and from statistics and reports that we've heard across the community that while he's offering what is being characterized as the highest level of community policing to specific business interests, he's also, or rather the department as a whole, is also refusing to answer calls to certain parts of town, to homeless shelters, um, is refusing to offer that same level of service to any other person who calls. I would commend a police chief having close relationships with community members across the board in an equal and service-oriented manner. This is not that. In Spokane, Channing Curtis, Crim2 News. A man nearly died at this crosswalk on Division and Roads. And now, not only is the city of Spokane expected to pay him $3.1 million for what happened here, the city is now looking at ways to make this crosswalk safer. About five years ago, Benjamin Gideon used this crosswalk to return to work. Court documents say he cleared the three northbound lanes on Division and waited in the median for southbound traffic to pause. A truck in the inside lane and another car on the outside lane slowed, but the car in the center lane failed to stop. This caused Gideon to hit the windshield and was thrown 51 feet onto the street. He suffered traumatic brain injury from this collision. He had a very long re rehabilitation process, just learning again how to eat, uh, how to walk, uh, uh, speaking again. That's Gideon's attorney, Cindy Schwartz. The lawsuit says her team found four other victims were hit by cars and seriously injured when they attempted to cross the same intersection. Well, it just helped reinforce the fact that it's a dangerous crosswalk and and motorists don't you know, don't really realize that there's a crosswalk there. The lawsuit also says in 2008, an engineering firm prepared a study for the city of Spokane regarding pedestrian crossings on division. In that study, the firm specifically said flashing signals would be needed at the Rhodes Avenue crosswalk for pedestrian safety. Something like the beacon seen here at Ruby near Gonzaga, which stops traffic completely, or signals like this that heighten drivers' awareness of a crosswalk. But the city did not include these signals when it built the crossing four years after the study. Documents say Gideon's medical bills totaled nearly half a million dollars. Although crosswalk improvements were not part of the settlement, the city is currently evaluating options and searching for funding to make this crossing safer. He worries about other people getting hurt at the same intersection. So um, finding out that the city's going to, to be putting a warning system at that intersection has made him very, very happy. Amanda Rowley, Krem 2 News. Michael Cotter made his first court appearance today where a judge set his bond for $15,000 following an alleged hit and run. The alleged hit and run happened in an empty lot near North Center in Illinois. Court documents say around 4 p.m. Thursday, suspect Michael Cotter asked for help with his car. Exclusive Creme 2 obtained surveillance video shows after getting a jump, Cotter allegedly hit the man who helped him and pinned him to his car. The video also shows the suspect walking past the victim to remove jumper cables and then driving away. Court documents say a witness told police they saw the victim on the ground after the collision. The witness claims the suspect did not exchange information or call 911. The victim laid on the ground for the next 10 minutes until first responders arrived. Spokane police arrested Cotter Saturday. Court documents say during his arrest, Cotter told police he was in an accident where his car lurched forward and he hit the victim. He claimed he panicked and left the scene. He's now facing felony hit and run charges. People who know the victim say it's unfortunate a good person is now hospitalized after trying to do something nice for someone they didn't know. Cotter's next court appearance is scheduled for April 4th. In Spokane, Janelle Finch, Creme 2 News. Behind me is Basic American Foods, the food processing plant that caught fire last night. Now in the daylight, we can finally see just how badly the fire damaged one of its buildings. The Grant County Sheriff's Office confirms the third floor sustained the most fire damage. Several videos and photos shared by witnesses show just how massive the fire was. This is what Trent Cleverly and his wife returned home to. They live about a quarter mile from the plant. The roof flying and 
along the wall of it was just flames were just coming off of it. The local farmer told me over the phone he recalls hearing a loud thump earlier in the evening, but didn't expect to find this scene in his backyard. I was hearing the fire trucks and I was like, what's going on type thing? Cause it was, I mean, it sounded like it's coming down our lane. And as I walk around the backside of the house, that's when I see an American potato completely you know, up in flames. And anyway, I was just shocked by that. We've not been able to confirm if basic American foods continued operations today, but the parking lot appears mostly full. And we saw people coming and going from the building this afternoon. At this point, we don't know if there were any injuries reported, but right now the Grant County Fire Marshal is investigating what caused this fire. Reporting in Moses Lake, Amanda Rowley, Creme 2 News. The North-South Freeway might not be delayed after all. A new transportation budget in the Washington State House would keep funding in place for the North Spokane Corridor. This comes after Jay Inslee proposed delaying the project at the beginning of the year. 70 years, that's how long Spokane residents been waiting for the North-South Freeway. I think that it should go forward um, faster. It helps the community, it, it provides jobs for people. Um, and that seems to be, you know, a big issue. Bobby Fowler has lived in Spokane her whole life. She says it's getting frustrating at how long the freeway is taking. It's been a big inconvenience just due to the fact that there are a lot of roads that you're not able to access because of it. In January, Inslee cited rising construction costs and less money available to fund the project. This would have delayed the project for six years or more. <laughs> but people might not have to wait longer than they thought. We want to see this happening. I mean, the project is going full swing right now, so why stop something that's already happening? The House released its transportation budget proposal yesterday, featuring some key changes from Governor Jay Inslee's proposed transportation budget. In the proposal, lawmakers like Marcus Riccelli want to continue to fund major projects like the North Spokane Corridor. We were most opposed to a halt in the project because we knew that it would cost significant economic impacts to our region. So completing this will keep good paying jobs moving forward and get us closer to uh, less emissions, quicker travel times. The Washington State Department of Transportation told CREM2 that the North-South Freeway project is on track to be finished in 2028. So for now, Bobby doesn't mind the construction. It's good. I mean, we get a lot of the construction workers in the morning before they start work, coming in to get coffee, they come in to get snacks, treats. The project first broke ground in 2001, and when completed, will be a 10.5-mile stretch of highway from Wandermere to I-90. The proposed budget for the North Spokane Corridor is set for more than $166 million, and it still needs the approval of lawmakers and the governor. In the newsroom, Nathan Hyun, Krem 2 News. Washington State University has a lot to celebrate today. Go Cougs! Not only is it the university's 133rd birthday, happy birthday today, but it's also announcing Eastern Washington's first pediatric residency program in partnership with Providence. I can't think of a better way to celebrate uh, that event uh, than really announcing this pediatric residency partnership today. Support from community partners, including Community Cancer Fund and Primera Blue Cross, made the program possible. It's a three-year residency with 18 spots. Six residents will be admitted into the program each year, and leading them will be Providence's Dr. Christian Rochelle. When you have a smaller program in a city where it has a lot of opportunity, there's not that limitation of competing with other learners for experiences and procedures. So they will have a lot of hands-on opportunity. Pediatric resident training will take place primarily at Providence Sacred Heart Children's Hospital with several outpatient experiences at pediatric clinics in the community, like this one here at Grand Pediatrics. Anybody who's involved with pediatrics is going to be teaching the residents. The College of Medicine's interim dean, Dr. James Record, says this program is what the state's rural and underserved communities need. We're in desperate need for students to stay as practicing residents and then practicing physicians to ensure that our access and the quality of care is the highest it can be for those kids. Recruitment for the inaugural class will begin later this year with the first residents expected to start their training in summer 2024, which is a day WSU and Providence are looking forward to celebrating.
Amanda Rowley, Krem 2 News. The U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs says the PACT Act is perhaps the largest health care and benefit expansion in VA history. Veterans exposed to toxins, airborne hazards, chemicals, radiation, or other occupational hazards during wartime service in Vietnam, the Gulf War, or post-9-11 War on Terror are eligible to enroll and get screened for their exposure. So veterans were exposed to burn pits, toxic exposure, Agent Orange, they no longer have to prove that the condition they have is because of that exposure. The PACT Act recognizes that. Tonight, officials from the VA hosted a veterans town hall in Spokane Valley, encouraging vets to apply. We shouldn't expect our veterans to travel great distances to come and see us. So we should go and see our veterans and make sure that we're delivering the message to them. The VA says 43,000 vets across the Inland Northwest are eligible for PACT Act benefits, including an estimated 14,000 who've never enrolled in the VA. While there is no deadline to apply, vets who submit a claim before August 10th could receive retroactive benefits going back to August 2022. There is no cost to apply. Vets can call a benefits counselor at 1-800-827-1000 or visit va.gov forward slash pact. That's P-A-C-T. Voltage Studios offers several different services out of its three shops here in Hayden. But one of those, according to the city, is breaking the law. There's no lack of options at Hayden's Voltage Studio shops. <laughs> Miranda Wise's team keeps busy, whether you're getting color in a stylist chair or this one. But the future of Voltage Tattoos, opened in December 2021, isn't black and white. It is a lot of stress to worry about the livelihood of so many other people, not just my job in my business that I'm still trying to take care of clients. Um, it's, I bear that stress for each and every one of those girls that they won't have a place to go to work the next day. Earlier this month, Hayden City Council found Wise in violation of city zoning code, denying her appeal to allow her tattoo business to stay where it is. The problem is where Voltage Tattoo is located in the Central Business District. Hayden defines tattoo shops as personal services, which are allowed in commercial zoning areas. But in the CBD, tattoo shops are specifically banned. What is allowed and allowed is clear. They state in there that tattoo parlors and also piercing establishments are not allowed in their downtown district, which we are zoned for commercial zoning, but with an overlay of their downtown. Some city council members took issue with Wise trying to change the code after she'd already established her tattoo business. She was informed in October 2021 it wasn't allowed there. Honestly, the city believed that the proposed tenant um, wouldn't open for business in this location and would move to another location. I can't imagine opening a business after I get a letter saying that I can't have a verification of occupancy and simply because a, a city employee did not get back to me to just hope or assume that all is good. But Wise argues she runs a personal service and retail space that also offers tattoos. She says she was working with a city staffer, but that communication dropped off. So he said there was an appeal process. He didn't know it, and he that's where he would be getting back to me on it. And you didn't follow up at all after that? Honestly, no. Okay, Wait, I'm... Yeah, that's, yeah. Now Wise plans to go in front of city council again, this time through an attorney in the next couple weeks. So I met with my lawyer and the next step in the process is to do a secondary request for reconsideration. Wise says while that process plays out, the tattooing portion of Voltage is allowed to stay open. I know it's not ultimately their goal to want to shut down a thriving business in the midst of a potential recession, um, but they're trying to abide by their codes as much as they can see, um, even though there's room for discretion within those. So 
Everyone wants to try to find a neutral ground to make everybody happy on. Crumb News also reached out to the city of Hayden, but because Voltage has hired an attorney and started a legal process, city staff couldn't comment. In Hayden, Shannon Mowdy, Crumb 2 News. Get him. Good job, buddy. Everything was on track for the largest ever icebreaker run. The event raises thousands for Double J Dog Ranch, a nonprofit that finds homes for special yeah, needs dogs. Unfortunately, we fell victim to Mother Nature this year. Come on! More than 700 people were signed up for this year's event, but Christine Justice, the founder of the nonprofit, recently learned that they had to cancel it because the field that cars park on is unstable. It still hasn't recovered from the winter. We learned last week we, you know, were holding out hope that we'd have a lot of sunshine and some warmer days. It's definitely nobody's fault. Christine says they've considered other options, but city officials are not allowing people to park on the side of the road and it's just not feasible to shuttle people from another location. Sit. Such a good boy. We will exhaust all of our avenues for next year to make sure we don't run up against this problem again. I'm standing on the field where parking takes place and I had a chance to test out the ground. Take a look, even when just walking on it, you can see water start coming out of it and that's what organizers are afraid of. With more than 700 cars expected to come for the event, that will just start tearing up the ground and that's something they can't risk. The nonprofit has already spent more than $11,000 on this year's event. This includes more than 700 shirts, which is costing us about $9,000 all said and done. Our finisher dog tags was about $2,400. We had 900 of them made. Before the cancellation, the icebreaker run was estimated to raise around $20,000 to help cover expenses and raise money for the nonprofit. Even though they are now processing refunds, Pepper, jump. many sponsors and participants have told them to keep the money as a donation. So although it looks like we're going to be able to cover our expenses this year, we are not going to have the profits. And without those profits, there will be fewer dogs that we will be able to bring into our program and care for this year. If you want to support Double J Dog Ranch, you can sign up for their virtual run. I will always be hopeful and I don't give in or give up. Um, but that's because of our community. Our community is rallying around us. And for more information on how you can sign up, check out our website at krem.com. <laughs> In Hauser, Nathan Hun, Krem 2 News. Governor Inslee made a stop at the Grant County International Airport to check out some innovations in aviation and to find out how to foster this technology in Washington State. In September, the first all-electric passenger plane took off from Grant County's airport. And Tuesday, Governor Jay Inslee took a seat in the cockpit. So I could not be more thrilling. It'd be like sort of being a kitty hawk back in the day with the Wright brothers. That's the level of innovation that folks are doing right here in central Washington. Eviation's electric plane could cut a four-hour car ride into a 45-minute plane trip, says President and CEO Gregory Davis. It's just going to, it, it can change an overnight trip into a day trip, and it makes that travel that much more convenient for people. And cleaner. And cleaner. Inslee also saw another aviation advancement in the world's first hydrogen-powered plane. But there are barriers to advancing this technology in Washington. And what we're, what we're looking for is things like uh, Im improving the availability of, of electric power for the charging network. So these are, this is areas where, you know, wa Washington State with the Washington State DOT um, plan for the electric airport expansion. And this, this can come in and actually help boost the industry, uh, making it that much easier for operators to come and, uh, and start using electric planes. It might be kind of surprising. We need housing. There might be a thousand new jobs associated with these three companies coming to Moses Lake. That means we need housing. Inslee's pushing the state legislature to back a four billion dollar bond to fund more housing. But I'm trying to develop more zeros to free up money for this kind of thing. And says his office will also look at more federal dollars. Now the Inflation Reduction Act, as you know, has a clean energy money as well, and we scrub that. To fund the future of flight taking off here in Grant County. When you look at Alice, what you're seeing is an aircraft that's going to be available for, 
for you and me to fly in in a few years. The governor also made a couple more stops on this trip, including to Big Bend Community College to discuss electric car batteries and farm working and immigration. In Moses Lake, Shannon Mowdy, Krem2 News. I'm here at the podium, just one site for the Pacific Northwest Qualifier, which draws in tens of thousands of athletes and fans tracking a different kind of bracket. USA Volleyball's Pacific Northwest Qualifier is in town, drawing thousands of excited athletes and fans into Spokane, which is also exciting for Spokane's economy, says Ashley Blake with Spokane Sports the largest economic development uh, event that we host in the city. And That's thanks to the tens of thousands of people turning out over the course of two weekends, like Patty Cole. So it's it's huge. I don't know how many teams exactly there are, but you know, it's, it's a lot. This packed tourney has 800 teams to be exact, with about 12,000 athletes maxing out the competition slots. Some of the more than 14,000 visiting spectators are no strangers to Spokane. Stephanie Hutchinson's been here three times. We love the Riverfront Park. The girls spend a lot of time sliding down the wagon or shopping. Uh, they always love the gelato that's over in downtown. But even newcomers spending about four days on average mean big business for Spokane, about $26 million worth. So that's new money coming into our market through stays at hotels, uh, restaurants, retail, recreation. That's kind of the infusion of new dollars into our economy. A big win for our city. And who knows, some visitors may become neighbors. And we love it. Wouldn't mind even living here. <laughs> Here's another stat for you. Over the run of this tourney, local partnering hotels are expected to see about 16,000 room stays. Shannon Mowdy, Crem2 News. Well, a big day here in Pullman. Pro day for the WSU football players hoping to hear their names called in the upcoming NFL draft. There was a litany of NFL scouts present today most looking forward to seeing the main attraction, linebacker Dayon Henley. A standout of the NFL Combine returned to Pullman and wowed scouts with 19 reps of 225 pounds on bench press and a 37 and a half inch vertical jump. Henley says he hopes his work speaks for itself. This is an interview. Every part of this process has been an interview. Everything that I put out there is a part of my resume. So to be out there by myself, you look at it like, dang, I'm by myself, I'm gonna have a lot of pressure on me, but then it's like, this is where you wanna be. Henley has become a popular name for moving up in the draft due to his athleticism and ball skills as a linebacker. He is preparing to start right away in the NFL. And as far as being coming to start, that's my goal. I tell each team the same thing. I, I plan to, to come out there and be a starter, so I'm going to put my best foot forward. And I've had a lot of conversations with teams where they say it's mutual interest for me to come out there and play, and that's just because it's a lot of teams with the same defensive scheme that I've been playing in. So I'm not going to say what those teams are, but just to have some teams that I know are room for me to in that draft and hoping that they get me is, is, is something that I, I'm happy for. Gonzaga Prep alum Armani Marsh is another Coug with his eyes set on the NFL. Marsh hopes a team takes a chance on him so he can earn a roster spot this fall. I mean, I just want um, someone to give me an opportunity and, you know, whoever gets me know that they're going to get a consistent, dedicated, resilient um, player, you know, who just wants to be the best they can be and, and a great teammate and help that organization win. The NFL draft is set to begin on April 27th and run through the 29th. You are most likely going to see Dayon Henley go really early on day two, and we'll see what happens for the rest of the WSU football players hoping to realize their dream coming up next month. For now, reporting at the bubble in Pullman, Andrew Quinn, Crum 2 Sports. Well, the building hasn't changed much in a hundred years. The gospel hasn't changed at all. I'm Pastor Dan York. We're standing in front of the old historic Dover Community Church. This church was originally built to be a 
summer cottage by the owner of the sawmill in Laclede, uh, Mr. A.C. White. And uh, in 1922, that sawmill burned down along with part of the town of Laclede. The buildings that survived for the most part were floated up here, and this was the only surviving one that was large enough to be a public building. So this summer will be 100 years since this has been uh, put into use as a church in Dover. There's a lot of history in this building. We have members that are up to over 80 years or 90 years of age who lived in this area practically their whole lives long. But we don't have anybody that's, that was here when this church came up here. <laughs> We've noticed that the foundation on the west side was really getting to be in poor condition. It was a series of concrete piers. They were beginning to rot away. We've spent over $40,000 fixing that up. There's more work to do. The siding on the building, which is uh, cedar bark, we're hoping to replace quite a bit of that. We've got everything we've done so far paid for. We're looking to raise more money, and of course, we like more people to come to church, too. That bell tower up there, there's a bell in that. Rings every Sunday morning at 9 o'clock. It's, it's a part of the overall atmosphere of the town. It includes this church, and we want to preserve it and see it continue, you know, for another hundred years. <laughs> Thank you for joining us here on Krem 2 Plus for a look at some of the biggest news stories of the past week. For the most current news throughout the weekend, you can watch our latest newscast right here on Krem 2 Plus. Just look for them in the bottom navigation menu. I'm Tim Pham. Thanks for watching.